Good evening, everybody. Hope you've enjoyed uh, some nice sausage rolls and, uh, and a cookie. Welcome along to uh, tonight. Um, we welcome you here into our Science Innovation Centre here at Penrose, and we hope you uh, enjoy today's lecture. Um, and uh, we're really excited to have Professor Gretchen here sharing with us. I'm just going to start with an acknowledgement of country, and um, then I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Dina Spagnoli to introduce our speaker, so we'll get straight into it. We respectfully acknowledge the Wujuk people of the Noongar Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we stand and pay our respect to elders past, present and future. Together we acknowledge the contributions of Aboriginal Australians and non-Aboriginal Australians to the education of all ch children and people in this country we all live in and share together. Uh, so it's a great uh, time to be together. I hope you really enjoy uh, tonight's lecture. We've got people uh, tuned in on Facebook as well. Uh, and at the end of the lecture, we'll have a Q&A session uh, where you guys can answer some, ask some questions. We've got a box we'll throw at you with a, with a microphone inside it uh, so we can hear your question. You've got to catch it. That's the catch. Uh, and um, we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end of the evening. Um, but we really hope you liked, uh, enjoyed tonight, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Dina Spagnoli from UWA to uh, speak with you and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for um, the introduction. Uh, my name is Dino Spagnoli. I'm a lecturer from the University of Western Australia, and I'm also the chair of the Chemical Education Group from the WA branch of the Royal Australian Chemical In Institute. And one of my roles as chair is to organise these um, lectures, which is the Bayliss Youth Lecture. And the Bayliss Youth Lecture is named after um, the, one of the eminent professors at UWA, uh, Sir Noel Bayliss, um, and it's in honour of him because he made such a large contribution to chemistry, in particular to education in WA. Um, I'll start off with some thanks uh, first. Thank you first to Brenton for being such a generous host and to hosting this, the first of our series of lectures. Um, when Brenton first contacted me and um, about something else, I put into his hand um, the lecture that we were organising uh, today and he said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hold, host one here at Penrose, which was really, really great. Um, and then he said that we may be able to record it and we may be able to live stream it. And I was like, wow, this is, this is absolutely incredible. We are the first time that the Vedas Youth Lecture has ever been live streamed. And so this is a first. So history is in the making here today. Um, the other people I'd like to thank is um, these companies or these organizations down below. So Rose Scientific uh, provides funding every year to host the uh, Baelish Youth Lecture and to provide support, uh, Kirchin University and UWA, because that's who pays our wages, and uh, the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. Okay, um, and now I'd like to introduce our speaker. So I saw um, Gretchen give a talk in our, our school about, God, about two years ago now, and um, the way that she presented and the enthusiasm that she showed for her discipline, I just thought, wow, we need to get her to give a Baelish Youth Lecture to hopefully inspire the next generation of scientists. And that's really the key of the Baelish Youth Lecture, is to try to inspire the next generation of scientists to ask the big questions. And when we got talking together about what we'd speak about, what she'd speak about today, there really is truly no bigger questions. Um, even though I'm a chemist and um, we're representing the Royal Australian Chemical Institute now. Gretchen, I, I wouldn't say that she'd say that she is a chemist. However, she does use chemistry, she does use spectroscopy, uh, and she does use a whole range of techniques to answer these big questions. And so hopefully you'll see where chemistry, physics, geology, um, and the astrosciences all intermingle into solving these massive questions that we're trying to answer with the world. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, get our speaker on. So please join me in welcoming Gretchen to the stage. Okay, so the first trip is going to be getting the other talk up. So, stand by. Um, thank you. Um, 
thank you very much for inviting me and for hosting tonight. Um, it is uh, really nice to be here on for, for this first um, sorry, one minute to go in here and figure this out. Uh, for this first lecture. I'm really excited because this is the kind of thing I actually really love about my job is the ability to talk to young people and to hopefully inspire them, but mostly to kind of explain the things I do and why I like to do them. Um, and so tonight I'm gonna be talking to you about life in the universe, and that's a really, really big question. I am not going to answer this question. I am only gonna touch base on what can we know now? What do we know now? How can we kind of expand it out from doing things in the lab on Earth to trying to look at a, a planet around another star in order to kind of see if there's life there? How do we look for it? How do we find it? So I'm kind of hoping um, that these big questions will uh, inspire you all to start thinking, what can I do in the future? How could I, how could I help with this? And so, like Dino said, this is gonna come from um, a, a background that is not straight chemistry, but it will touch on a, a bunch of different things. So these are kind of the big things that we'll go through. So how did life start on Earth? Because we need to understand that if we wanna try and understand how it started anywhere else. And up until uh, about, do some math, uh, 25, 30 years ago, um, we didn't even know if there were other planets around other stars. It may have been only our solar system was the only place where this could occur. So a lot has changed in the last 30 years. So I'm gonna try and give you some background there. Um, and that's basically how we're gonna go. This image is just a nice art artistic image of potentially um, uh, life, or not life, uh, another planet where things may or may not be, be growing. Uh, before I go into the full talk about the biology and, and chemistry and geology, I'm gonna give you a bit of background about myself. I'm what I call an astrogeologist. It's not a real title, I made it up because I study rocks from space. And everybody always continually says, are you, do you study rocks or do you study space? And I say, I study both, it's what I do. But that's not where I started. I did not start here uh, by any stretch. I, um, as you may know from, or may be able to surmise from my accent, I am from the United States. So all of my education occurred in the United States. I went to high school in a really tiny town with a high school that had 300 students for years nine through 12. Um, uh, I graduated from there and I went to California and I went to a school at the University of California in Santa Cruz and I got an undergraduate degree in physics, uh, which is this image up here uh, so this image up here is, a, is an image, an aerial view of a particle accelerator that is um, at Stanford in California, the university, uh, Stanford University. And what happens there is, um, this is where my interest in chemistry came from, but I didn't realize it was an interest in chemistry until I kind of got down here to th this area, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but I did an internship uh, during during my time as an undergraduate, I did an internship at this particle accelerator, and I started learning about different particles. And we have heard, I'm sure you have heard of different elements. So we look here at the periodic table, we talk about elements. Those elements are composed of smaller things called protons and electrons and neutrons. Well, you can start getting things even smaller than that. And these particle accelerators, they take things like electrons and speed them up to almost the speed of light and they smash them together and they try to see what's gonna happen. They take protons and do the same thing. They have found ways to do this such that they create massive amounts of energy in this really tiny, tiny area. They create whole new particles. Particle physics is the basis of chemistry. So this is where I started and I got this bachelor's in physics and then I thought, okay, I like this, but I don't want to continue in particle physics. It's really, really interesting, but I, I just don't really know what I want to do there. I had done a second internship that had to do with asteroids. So I started looking at all the asteroids 
it was all statistics. It was all the asteroids that might be coming close to the Earth. So you may have seen over the weekend, there was a headline that there was a very close approaching asteroid that passed by Earth. Now, close approaching to astronomers means that it was well outside the orbit of the moon. It means it wasn't even gonna come close to hitting us anytime soon. But what those mean is that when you work out orbits from physics, you can work out over time how close they might come. So it's always good to have an idea of where these things are. So my second internship was about trying to figure out, is there a way we can statistically figure out how many of these things might be close enough to us? So that got me started thinking about asteroids. And so I thought, well, no, I like doing asteroid stuff. They're pretty cool. They're, it's space, and I like space. So I did a master's degree, but it turned out I did a master's degree in engineering. And this came about because I was doing an experiment. And I basically had a tiny little particle accelerator in a lab in Virginia, and I fired a beam of hydrogen at a rock. And I wanted to see what happened to the spectra of that rock. So spectra is a word we use that is to tell us how a substance or a rock or something is interacting with a, a form of energy. And so we can read what that form of energy. So when we look at asteroids in space, we can tell what they're composed of by looking at how sunlight reflects off of them. So we can see from the bumps and the wiggles that that means that these elements are present and that's really helpful for us understanding what's going on in the solar system. So I got the engineering degree, even though I was doing more or less spacey stuff and trying to understand how is the solar wind interacting with planetary bodies. That got me thinking, I don't know anything about rocks. I'm hitting this rock with a beam of, electron, of hydrogen, I have no idea what this rock thing is about. And so I took a geology class to, sit, to, to try it out, just to get some background. And I was like, oh, why didn't I find geology the first time around? But I really love that I did physics, and I really love that I did engineering. But geology is where I, I landed. And the fact that I got to do um, geology, I got my PhD in geology, which means I had to take a whole bunch of undergrad classes, but I already knew how to do a bunch of other things. So I got this, this uh, higher degree uh, before I go too far because I wanted to look at meteorites. So meteorites are rocks from space. So I had been looking at space rocks. The rocks that we get from those asteroids come to Earth as meteorites. All of these stories will come back and come full circle. So I got my PhD in, in geology and geophysics because I, I looked at rocks, but I have been looking at the chemistry and mineralogy of these space rocks for quite some time. Now, I did all that in America, and America has a really big space program. So how, how did I get to Australia? So I started off in a little town in a state called Idaho. It's very, very small, very underpopulated. Kind of, uh, I, I do, I, it's, it's a lot smaller than Western Australia, but it has a kind of similar feel. We have one big town, and then everything else is regional. So we were kind of like that. Um, from there, I went to California. I did my undergrad degree. I stayed in California, got my master's degree. I went to Hawaii, got my PhD. What I want you to see here is there is a steady, steady directionality to the south because where I lived, it was cold, and I did not like it. So I left, I got my PhD, I went back to California, and then I went to the East Coast of America. I was in Virginia, I was in Washington, D.C. I went from there to the middle of the country, to Missouri, totally landlocked. I had lived in California and Hawaii, which is like, it's like here, you have ocean, you go straight to the beach, it's great, landlocked. Not good for me. Uh, from there, I went to London. I was in London for six and a half years. I worked at the Natural History Museum, which has the third largest meteorite collection in the world. Me in a meteorite collection is like a kid in a candy store. It's like you're reading a paper going, oh yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> I can get up from my desk and walk out my door and open a locker and there's the rock that they're talking about, right? It was exciting, I loved it. But then we came to Australia. Um, and we came to Australia because, uh, in addition to myself being a, an astrogeologist, geeky person, 
my husband's partner is also a space scientist, planetary scientist, and he had set up in the outback here in Australia a whole um, network of cameras that just take pictures of the sky. And he had done this for London, and he was flying here all the time. And he had set up three or four different camera cameras, but we needed more. So basically, we came here in 2012 uh, to go out into the outback, take pictures every night of the sky, follow fireballs. We have a whole team now. We have built this up over the last eight years from the two of us to more than 50 people, staff and students, who are now what, part of the Space Science and Technology Center, and we're based at Curtin University. We started with this camera network. We now have a global fireball network. We have cameras that look at the sky every night. They look for uh, incoming fireballs that we know are gonna drop material. We can go and find that material. We can take it back to our labs, we can look at it. It helps us start to unravel. We get a, a really interesting idea. We can get the orbit of where they came from in the solar system. That tells us a lot about uh, the geological, basically it's geological map of the solar system. So we're figuring out what compositions are where in the solar system. Um, we are, as a group, we are the, the uh, representatives to NASA um, for, for Australia. We cover a whole range of research. So we, we have, we're very research oriented and we're very planetary oriented, but we also do uh, space engineering. So we build spacecraft. Um, we also have lots of people involved with different missions. So we have people that are involved with very current missions. Uh, a couple of people, one person in particular has been working with the Chinese on the Chang'e 5 and Chang'e 6 missions to the moon. So they just went, brought materials back. So it's, we're very excited. Okay, that was very long-winded. Talked too much about myself, but now you know I had a very extremely, um, a varied background and I was able to pivot to get to where I am today. What I'm gonna spend the rest of uh, the time talking to you about is astrobiology. It's life in the universe. How do we know about life? Weirdly enough, my first postdoctoral, or my second postdoctoral uh, position was astrobiology. Um, but I was looking, and, and it was very chemical in orientation. I was looking um, at isotopes. So isotopes are uh, types of uh, ways that we can actually identify certain processes that happen in rocks, if we can measure these things. So that was my job and I was able to do that. But astrobiology is very, what we call multidisciplinary. It means that you are combining astrobiology, you're combining a bunch of different things. Um, and so in our case, we're combining not just astronomy and biology, it's combining geology and chemistry as well. So we pull everything together to try and understand something about how do we identify life? And I'll get to the reasons behind astrobiology, why it's such a, a hot topic right now for um, a lot of people. Um, is especially, we wanna look at part, the, the, the remit of astrobiology. NASA has a whole institute about it, but we have astrobiology happening in all kinds of different countries. Australia, sorry. Australia has, <laughs> I'll stand in front of the microphone. Australia has its own node for astrobiology and there are um, nodes in a bunch of different countries. And it's all about trying to understand has life form on Earth? If we understand how life forms on Earth, how does it form in the solar system? Can it form in the solar system? Can we find evidence of it? And then finally, can we find evidence of it in the stars? So. We have to start with some basic questions, right? So what is life? Um, I'm sure that in our, our classes, um, we've talked about biology, we've talked about what constitutes something being alive. What is, what are, what's the definition there? And we have some physiology. So you can say that it has to be capable of eating, it has to metabolize, it has to excrete, it has to breathe, it has to move, it has to grow, it has to reproduce, and it has to respond to external stimuli. So we can kind of, we can, we can do a bunch of tests and say, okay, yeah, I, I do all those things. Um, a tree does all those things, but not in quite the same way I do it. Um, a microbe might do it, uh, but might 
might not in the same way. Um, but if you start digging into this, this is a very like strict definition. And if you start digging into what constitutes something being alive, it's actually really, there's a lot of debate about it. So I included that, that link there. If you want, I can leave it and people can go and look at it. Um, it's really interesting to read through it and just list, list, see all the things that are kind of confusing about it. So basically what we're, what we're learning is that it's a, it's a work in progress. It's gonna change, this definition is gonna change over time. So what we're gonna focus on is what do we know right now? What do we know about life here? So what we know about life here, how do we build it up? So we're gonna build it up from scratch. So if we go back to my original physics degree, it was all particles. Particles fit directly into elements. So now we, here we are with the elements. We need some basic elements. If we look at the most abundant elements in the universe, not just the solar system, not just our galaxy, but in the entire universe, you'll start to see some patterns. And we start to see that the things that create life and make life are partly because there's enough of that material around. So the main chemical elements that we like to talk about with life are hydrogen and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So these six elements are the main, uh, the main uh, elements that go into life. They, can't, they end up being called chinops. So we're gonna talk about them from chinops. I am not gonna go into any details on how bonding works or anything like that. I'm only talking about how these things get put together. The next thing is after you've got those elements, what do you do with them? Well, they start to come together. They do bond in some ways and they form molecules. Molecules are multiple elements stuck together. Uh, in the case of life, what, what makes it organic, what makes it life is that it has a carbon backbone. The molecules that we have have carbon backbone. So that means that they're built up from carbon. So we've got the basic elements, we created some molecules. Those molecules have come together and formed these things that have this carbon backbone. That carbon backbone is called an amino, the, the, the thing that comes off of that, the molecule is called an amino acid. If we string a bunch of amino acids together, we get something called a protein. So you can see we're building up all these elements, they're kind of coming together. We still can't see these with our eyes, just, you know, just so you know. This is what makes this really interesting. After we have proteins, we can start to kind of bend things around, but you can see that elementally, we've got the same stuff. We've got hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, sometimes phosphorus, sometimes sulfur. All of those things are still in there. These are now what we call sugars. And this is, this is sugar like the sugar we eat, but it's also a different kind of thing. It has to do with energy. So it's called a sugar and it has to do with what the thing is that we eat, but sugars are a much bigger uh, type of um, structure. So we've got proteins, we've got molecules, we made the amino acids, we've strung them into proteins, we've created some sugars. If we combine sugars and proteins, we get to DNA. So you all have heard of DNA. DNA is the stuff that we're made of, it's the stuff that replicates, it's the stuff that tells our cells what to do, it it's the stuff that is life. And it's just not, it's not just human, it's every, everything in life has DNA. So we've got DNA, so we've built it up. Now, this is not how it works, it doesn't build up like that. We have to have a vessel, we have to have something to hold it. This is where cells come in. So again, in my very simplistic way to think about this, you need a cell. The cell is basically this membrane. The membrane is what holds stuff inside of it. So the stuff inside of it consists of an energy system. It's gotta have something that will let it keep going. So for us, we take food in, that's our energy. For plants, they take sunshine in, that's their energy. That stuff goes into the, into the cells, but the cells also need some sort of information system. That's where the, the DNA comes in. So all of this has to be housed together. All right, so all life on Earth has these different characteristics. This is a much less simplistic drawing of a cell. So you see that it's got the big, does this have a pointer? I'm not gonna touch it. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so you can see that it has this big, this membrane around it. You can see that there are different parts of it. The nucleus is, is there that houses parts of it. There's energy things. There's things that will take in the energy and convert it for you. I have no idea about this. This is not my area. I'm not a biologist. But I just love the idea that it's very, it's a very uh, defined thing. You put these things in, you're going to create this. So now we get to the part where water is important. Why is water important? We hear about this all the time. Drink eight glasses of water a day. Why do you need water? What does that do? Well, water is really, really cool. Water is a molecule that, because of its shape, the, because of the way the oxygens and the hydrogen come together, means that it has this capability of um, being able to do a bunch of different things that are really, really helpful. So it's got this what we call bunny ears structure. So under normal circumstances, you might think that you'd have a big hydrogen um, atom in the middle and you just stick your two oxygens on the edge. But that's not how it works. That's not the most energy efficient configuration of that structure. So it actually is the little oxygens kind of come together a bit closer and they form this kind of bunny ear look. But what that does is that means that the hydrogen, which is basically just a proton, and the oxygens, they have opposite charges. It means that you get a slight, even though the whole thing is balanced, you have slight pulls in different directions, which is what lets water do really cool things like be a fantastic solvent. So when you're washing your dishes, what water is doing, that little charge difference is actually allowing you to like scrub things off your dishes. It's helping with pulling all of that apart. But it's very cool because that also means that the reactions that you need, it, it behaves as a catalyst that's really useful for the reactions you need to form all those um, building blocks so you can get to the cell. In addition, it helps protect the cell. It's got 80% water in the cell. So all of those little bits that are in there and having to do things, they're protected by the water. So water is extraordinarily important when we're trying to figure out how does life form. And I'll come back to this because when we get to the, the space part of this, the space science part of this, one of the main things that we end up doing is we are looking for water. Where's the water? If we find the water, all we gotta do is find the other elements. And then we've got some ideas about maybe we're making a good soup here. Okay, I have to do a tiny bit of a chemistry lesson. This is called a phase diagram. And I'm gonna try and give this to you. It's very straightforward. It's just to show you how we can use this kind of information to understand uh, how, understand different environments on Earth as well as environments in other places. So this is a phase diagram. It is a plot of temperature across the bottom and it's uh, pressure on the side. You don't have to know any of these things. It's just to say these are kind of, these are units that you're aware of. So if you are at sea level on the earth, so that's basically Perth, if you go and you take a glass of water and you freeze it down to zero degrees, you're gonna get ice, right? And if you take that glass of water and you put it in a kettle and you, and you get heated up at 100 degrees, it will start going from liquid to gas. So liquid to solid, liquid to gas. So this area in the middle, that's where liquid exists. And it's, it's a really defined pressure and temperature area, right? Um, this is what would happen if you went to the top of Mount Everest. So, the top of Mount Everest at, is at a much lower pressure, and what that means is now when you're looking at your temperatures, you're gonna freeze water, liquid, into ice at a higher temperature than zero, and you're gonna boil from liquid to gas, you're gonna do that at a much lower temperature, at about 70 degrees. So you could take a sip of your tea at the top of Mount Everest and it won't, it won't be hot, even though it's boiling. So that's kind of giving you the idea of what this is about. So another area of interest is this, this little space here. So this is giving you the pressure of the atmosphere in the Antarctic. 
So you all know what the Antarctic looks like, right? It's, it's a very icy place. So that's the pressure of the atmosphere in the Antarctic. So you can see why it would be mostly um, icy when you, when you look at it. it do, the temperature doesn't get above uh, freezing very often. Um, okay, so here's the space part. Okay, Mars. The current atmospheric pressure of Mars is in these particular pressure units, and they're about a million pressure units, so you don't need to think about those, just the numbers, the relative numbers are the thing. So is seven millibars, that's current Mars. How much liquid water do you think is on Mars? Looking at your phase diagram, what temperature do you have to get at to get liquid water? And then, later in life, I can tell you that the temperature on Mars doesn't get there very often and it's a really narrow range of temperature. So when we get to Mars, it's gonna be some interesting things. Now this is another area of interest. So Europa is a moon. We're gonna talk about Europa a little bit. Um, this is the pressure, surface pressure on Europa. So you can see that number is really, 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 really low. You're basically, there's no air there. Um, and that is showing you that you never get, on the surface, you never get liquid. You go straight from solid to gas or from gas back to solid because that pressure is too low. So that's it for your chemistry phase diagram lesson for the evening. What do we know about how life originated? Well, there have been a lot of, um, people have talked about it for a long time and thought about it for a long time. In the 50s, there was a whole bunch of stuff happening around, a lot around physics and a lot around chemistry people were discovering all these new elements, um, and they were starting to think about the solar system. They were starting to think, well, what is the solar system made of? What, what did the solar system look like before it became a sun and some planets? It was a big ball of gas. Is it possible that somewhere in that primordial goo, that's where life started? And so there were some people that did an experiment. It was uh, the Miller-Urey experiment, and they did this where they put um, water into um, a boiler thing. This is, this is showing you my chemistry. A boiler thingy, and then they heated it up, um, but they put, uh, they put some chemicals in that represented, represented primitive atmosphere of the Earth. So something that was super primitive, kind of full of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and a bunch of stuff, and they heated it up and they noticed that when they, when they did this and they had the water there, they got amino acids forming. So they thought, well, maybe this is the start of it. So this was, this was the ex experiment that they did to try and figure out, maybe this is how you start to pull all those elements together. So that was a, a starting point. Um, we started thinking about, well, when did Earth, when did life first arrive, on, not arrive, <laughs> It could have arrived, to be honest. Um, there's a whole Mars to Earth thing we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, so we have, here in WA, is the place where we have found the world's oldest fossils. So these are tiny, tiny, tiny bacteria that have fossilized. And so these are the first forms of life that we've been able to find um, for the Earth. And we can see that they have these really interesting, interesting features. Um, another thing is, well, how do we get, so we, we have this fossil life, it, it exists here. That means we had all the ingredients here. Where are the ingredients coming from? And, and we've got the energy source, something happened, that kicked off. So where do, where, do, where do the ingredients come from? Well, one of the things is meteorites. So this is where my stuff comes in. My astrogeology comes in. Yay, here, this is it. You get, you get the one rock. Uh, this is a rock, very famous rock in my world, <laughs> and it fell in Australia in 1969. This is the Murchison meteorite, and it was the, um, it fell a couple of months after the Apollo mission brought uh, samples back from the moon, and it's, um, it's in Victoria, it's called Murchison, um, and so it feels like it should be here in WA, but it's actually in Victoria, just north of Melbourne. Um, it is an amazing rock. It looks like a piece of coal if you look at it, and you would not, you, no one would ever go, oh, that's pretty. But when they started looking into it, it turns out it was full of organic material, full of bits and pieces of amino acids 
and it was full of amino acids that didn't seem to be anything that we had here on Earth. So we can kind of, the amino acids were the same, but the signatures were slightly different. And so it was like, okay, well, this is really extraterrestrial. Maybe this comes here, and then we can convert it to what we have here on Earth. Um, it also contains these really tiny things that look like cells. This is really tiny, 200 nanometers is that scale, which is, I think, too big for a cell. So it, it, these are not cells, but they have the shape of the cell. And so that's, the, this is all part of what we're finding inside of these meteorites. Not all of them. These are extremely rare. There are only, um, a, uh, there's 60,000 meteorites on Earth, and there are only a few of these types that have this organic material in them at this level. So they're really interesting to look at. They're also um, the oldest meteorites we have. So they're the, the, the things that we think of as the very beginning of the solar system. So it tells us what was the solar system composition like. It tells us what was happening sort of through that. Was there water? Was there other stuff happening? Um, the other thing about life that we need to know is that it can start, some people have thought it started in these hot smokers. So it could have started it under the water, the ocean, at these areas where volcanic vents are releasing all of these, these basically nutrients and, and the, the energy is there, but it's really, really hot. So it's kind of, we call it an extreme environment. The other option is in the frozen areas. So Antarctica, you can see algae growing on Antarctic ice and it's really, really cold. So these are called extreme environments. So life seems to be able to find ways to thrive in these really extreme environments. Okay. Now, so it seemed to follow a path on Earth. This is what we found. We needed some ingredients. We put them together. We needed water to make it go. Um, but we also know that this could, th these things could survive in really extreme places. So they could even form or originate in really extreme places. So where does that leave us? So let's go looking around. Let's see what we can find. Are we alone in the solar system? Are we the only ones here? That's our big question is, right, are we alone or is there stuff happening? So where are we gonna go look first? So pretty much anywhere outside of Earth is an extreme environment. So let's start with some icy moons. So if we go out to the outer solar system, so in the outer solar system, we have two gas giants and we have two ice giant planets. Uh, the two gas giant planets are Saturn and Jupiter, and the two ice giant planets are uh, Uranus and Neptune. We're not gonna talk about Uranus and Neptune. They have all kinds of moons. We talk, you can see some of them here. We're gonna focus on Jupiter and, and Saturn right now. So we've got some moons of Jupiter and Saturn that we, can, we have visited with spacecraft that in some cases we've landed on. Most of the time we've just flown past, but we have lots of questions based on all of this information. So we're gonna talk through some of these. The first one is Titan. So Titan is a moon of Saturn. It's the biggest moon of Saturn. This image is awesome, I found this today. This is an image that was taken by um, a spacecraft called Cassini. And it was basically flying through the rings of Saturn and it went and visited a whole bunch of its moons. The big moon there, sorry, maybe if we do this so people can see. So this one here, that's Titan. This is the, one, the rings of Saturn. So Saturn is over off in that direction to the left on your screen. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and this little guy here, we're gonna talk about in a minute as well. So this is Enceladus. So this is another moon of Saturn, but we're gonna focus here on Titan. And Titan is Saturn's largest moon, um, but most importantly, it's the only moon in the entire solar system with an atmosphere. No other moon has an atmosphere. There aren't, you know, the, the terrestrial planets, so Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the Earth, uh, Earth and Mars are the only two with moons. Venus and Mercury have no moons. Uh, the Earth's moon we look at every night. You can see from the fact that it has craters all over it that it has no atmosphere. Um, Mars's moons are probably asteroids that actually got caught in Mars's um, general vicinity. So they're super tiny and definitely have no atmosphere. 
the other moons in the solar system are all associated with the outer planets. And so, but this is the only one that has an atmosphere. It's actually quite a big, uh, big rock as well. Um, so you can see that it, the composition of the atmosphere is actually really interesting because it's mostly nitrogen. So on Earth, our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. We're, we're about 79% uh, nitrogen. Now, this, um, we couldn't go breathe here, but it doesn't mean that something else couldn't. So some characteristics, you can see that it's got, uh, it's got some, it's got a differentiated, um, it's a differentiated body, so that means it's like Earth. It's got a core, it's got a mantle, it's got a crust. It means that something happened that caused um, the basic building block that came together to melt, and then it separated based on density. And so we can learn a lot by um, seeing how spacecraft fly by these moons to figure out how much of that density is distributed. You can figure out by how these things fly by where it's distributed and see that it has a core. So there are a lot of asteroids that don't, and we know that because we've flown by them, and we see that. Um, and so you can see that it is bigger than our moon. So Titan is quite large. It's probably about the size of Mercury. Um, it has a very low bulk density. So density is how we measure planets on Earth. The de density of Earth on, on average is about five because we have a lot of rocks. This says it's about two. So that's just barely above what water density is. So it's really light. It's got light stuff on it. Um, what's really interesting about it is that the, it may have liquid water, but it may have ammonia in it. It also looks like the interior is decoupled from the crust, because so it means that the inner part is moving around because you can see things shifting. So on Earth, we have tectonics, but those tectonics aren't separating the crust from the under stuff. It's all kind of going together. This looks like there's a, something, a layer floating on top of another layer. So this kind of fits with all of that. Um, <coughs> What we want to know, based on what we've seen, based on the chemistry we see there, is it possible that we went from chemistry to biology? So can you get to life? Do we have all the ingredients that we, want, that we need? Um, and it could be, because of uh, the, the Miller-Urey experiment, they used a lot of methane. They used these things that we can find at Titan. Um, it may be that this is the ingredients are there. So then the next question is, do you have the right conditions? So do you have... An, do you have uh, the temperatures you need, do you have the water, do you have a lot of uh, quiescence and ability to do this? Um, you can get this ammonia water solution going down to 200 kilometers. Um, what you can see, this is a really nice image of Titan's atmosphere. You can see it's kind of an orangey atmosphere, and that's because it's, it's a methane-rich uh, body. Um, so the, the the thing is that the chemistry is different. So maybe here, uh, with, with Earth, we need water, but maybe on, on Titan, that uh, the life could actually exist in the methane. So it looks like there's rivers of methane, liquid methane, flowing on the surface. There's a, there's a spacecraft slated to go there in the future. It's called Dragonfly. It's going to be a little drone, and they're going to fly all over Titan, and they're going to take measurements and try to figure out what's happening there. So here are some implications uh, for Titan. So it's about the size of Mercury. It has, it has an atmosphere. It looks like it's got liquid, uh, liquid flowing on it, but it might not be water. So what that means is on Earth, we, uh, er, uh, we inhale oxygen, and that helps us do our energy processing. Uh, it would inhale hydrogen hydrogen gas instead of oxygen gas. Um, it would react it with a different sugar. Um, it would create something else. So it would create methane. Um, but if all of that were true, theoretically, we should be able to see evidence for that from our spacecraft going around it and some landing on it. And we haven't seen a whole lot of that. Um, but it might be that we just haven't had enough time to see all that. So Enceladus is our next one. So, so Titan is a big moon, 5,000 kilometers across. Uh, it's got a big atmosphere. Enceladus is completely different. It's tiny. It's 500 kilometers across. That's, that's almost 
Um, that's barely the size of some asteroids. Uh, so it's really small, but it's the brightest thing in the solar system. It has this super bright surface, very, very reflective, makes it really, really, really cold. Uh, but it has all these cracks on it as well. So this is another moon of Saturn. Um, it's uh, got, what is really interesting is when Cassini flew by, it caught um, these emissions coming out of the surface, which we have determined to be geysers. I'm American, I say geysers, it may be geysers, I'm not sure. It's when the water goes spurting out of the ground. On Earth it happens in volcanic things, on, on, on Enceladus it's an icy thing. Um, so it's got all these rifts going through, it's got some tectonic activity, it's very, there's a, it's clear there's a lot of movement, it's clear there's a lot of resurfacing. The reason I know there's a lot of resurfacing is that this is an atmosphereless body. It has no atmosphere and it has no craters. So very similar to Earth, on Earth we don't have we have craters, but they're they're much harder to get made because we have a big atmosphere. We have weather, we have oceans, we have a lot of things that basically resurface our Earth. So we don't see craters that often. So when you see a craterless surface on a body in the solar system, you know that surface is getting moved around a lot, which is really interesting to think about. It means there's, there's something, there's an energy, there's something happening there, it's moving, which is really, really cool. And what we've been able to determine is that based on how things cut across each other, so now we're in geology, uh, you can tell when things happen. You can tell when things, what happened first, what happened second. And by doing that, you can kind of backtrack and figure out that this is actually, all of this activity is really, really recent. And by recent, I mean less than 100 million years because we're speaking geologically here. And geologically, that's really, really young. Um, so this is a nice image that kind of shows some of this uh, geyser activity coming out of the, the side. Um, and it was Cassini just kind of flying by, accidentally caught it, completely changed what we thought Enceladus might be like. And so it might be that what we're looking at is that uh, we're trying to figure out what's going on on the inside. So another thing that happened was Cassini went by and there was this really weird pattern of fractures on the South Pole. Um, a secondary uh, flyby showed that if you look with um, basically a heat tracker, you can see that out of those fractures there's heat. And, and by heat, I don't mean it's, uh, you know, 80 degrees or, sorry, that's too hot, 40 degrees. Um, but what it is is that that's a, there's a significant temperature difference between the icy surface and the interior, and that is what's causing this uh, cryovolcanism. So that's what's causing these geysers to go out. You have this temperature variation and you start shooting out this water vapor. And so they could collect, they could, they could see that it was water vapor. So then they thought, well, maybe what's happening here is we've got an ice, a big ice shell and it's covering an ocean that's within that shell. Um, so we, we think that in terms of, of potential for life, Enceladus is a good place to, to tr track to. And um, it is probably, it's an icy sheet, it's got a thick icy crust, but it's got something underneath it that's probably liquid. And so that could be pure water. And we can, we can go and look at that. Um, it also looks like the vapor, when you analyze it, has salts in it. So salt just means that you have special, you have elements. So it's not just sodium and chloride. It's a whole bunch of different types of elements. And so those elements uh, means that there's potential for the ingredients that you need there. Okay, Europa is our next icy planet, icy moon, and Europa is a, a moon of Jupiter. It's the second closest moon of Jupiter. Um, uh, Europa was discovered by Galileo. It's one of the four Galilean moons. Um, apparently I have it on a slide thing. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was discovered by Galileo, the man, with his telescope, and then it was investigated further by Galileo, the spacecraft, much, much later. And they flew by and did a whole bunch of things. So what you can see is that you're, you're seeing that it's a silicate mantle covered by, um, based on how the spacecraft interacted with the body, you know that there's rock underneath the ice instead of water underneath the ice. 
So it's Enceladus, we have water under the ice. This, we have rock under the ice. Um, and it's got the smoothest surface in the solar system, which means, again, it's being resurfaced all the time. Um, this is just showing the, the, the cracking patterns that we're seeing. And you can see that the variation in, um, and more of the cracking patterns just to show that uh, the variation of the colors shows that you've got chemistry. You've got elements there that could be the potential ingredients for the, the uh, existence of life. And the fact that it's ice also tells us um, that it, it, we have water. We, have we could have the potential for liquid water. See how it is it's going forward without me telling it to, but that's okay. Um, again, we see a, a lot of this staining and interesting um, uh, cracking and cross-cutting features that show things are happening uh, over time. Um, it's got this freckled surface. Again, we're seeing a lot of, okay, we've got that. So what's our potential for life here? Um, it could be clustered around hydrothermal vents. So we're seeing these freckled surfaces, these, uh, these, this um, sort of orange color coloration. So it could be that we've got these hydrothermal vents that are kind of cutting through. Um, the uh, could be an ocean in there as well, and so there is potential that there could be real life in in a European ocean. So there's a there's um, currently a spacecraft that is investigating Jupiter called Juno, and it's going to different moons and it's looking at Jupiter as well. But there's a spacecraft that's slated to go called Europa Clipper, and it's actually going to drill into the ice, and so it's going to actually try to get into and under that ice to see what's under there and figure it out. And that's kind of an a artist's rendition of what that spacecraft might do. Um, so we've been looking at icy planets, and, and we've been looking at that because we've been thinking about what are the extreme possibilities. Now, what we don't have here is any evidence for real life, but we have ideas that there could be uh, the conditions and the ingredients available so we could get to life. But when we think about where are you really going to find the things you need, you need to have the just right area. So you need a habitable zone. We call it a habitable zone, or you call it the Goldilocks zone because it's the just right zone. If you're too close to the sun, you're going to boil off all your water. If you're too close to the star, sorry, our sun is a star. So we can generic, we can make this whole argument generic. Uh, if you're too close to it, you're going to boil off all your water. If you're too far away from it, it's all going to be in ice form, and your reactions are going to be too slow to be meaningful. So you need it to be in this really tight zone. So this is for our solar system. You can work out a habitable zone for every single star if we go looking. We'll talk more about that when we get to the exoplanets at the end. Um, so what, what I'm going to do now is, because this is our habitable zone, Earth is smack in the middle of it, and we know it is because we have 70% of the Earth is covered with water, uh, liquid water. Um, Venus is at the, uh, the inner edge of the zone. Uh, Venus is completely inhospitable, uninhabitable. Nobody would ever live there. It's got a ridiculously huge uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere that would kill us in an instant. It actually has, cr the pressure of it has actually crushed spacecraft that have landed on it. It doesn't eat them away, but there's also sulfuric or acid rain issues as well. So Venus, not happening. It's at the inner end, but they're not going to go there. Mars is at the outer edge of this Goldilocks zone. Mars is probably our best option to try and see if life can exist in more than one place in the solar system. So it's at the outer edge. It's really accessible. I don't know if you know, three spacecraft were sent to Mars last year. They were launched in July. They all got into orbit or landed in February. It's a six-month trip during a certain time of year. It's really easy. It's really straightforward. I mean, you can't send people there yet, but, but we can send all kinds of spacecraft there at the moment. Um, but what's also great about it is it, it is close, it is accessible, we can talk to Mars, it's a 20 minute round trip, you know, so a bit of lag, but it's not too bad. Uh, it means we can actually do some really interesting experiments right now and try to find things. Um, 
a lot of this comes from, and this is where the word astrobiology got reborn. So in 1996, there was a paper that came out, and so now we're back on the astrogeology. This is a rock, this is a meteorite. It was found in Antarctica. Um, it was misclassified initially because of the way it looked, and it was not thought to come from Mars, but it was reclassified later and found that it did come from Mars. So I was telling you earlier, we've got about 60,000 meteorites on Earth. Most of those come from asteroids. Most of those come from the, the asteroid belt, which is in between Mars and Jupiter. But there's 140 out of those, 150 out of those 60,000 that come from Mars. And they come from um, different parts of Mars. We don't know exactly where they come from, from on Mars, but they tell us a lot about that, uh, the, the planet and what's happening there. This one, uh, most of the rocks tell us about volcanic activity. This one was weird because it was really old. Most of the ones we have are really young, geologically speaking. Um, this one is really old. This one is almost the age of the solar system. So this one's about 4.3 billion years old. And when people start, or 4.1, when people were looking at it, they started kind of digging into it. They found these weird features, um, and they are these little circular things right here. So these orange, and they've got this stripy thing around them. These are called carbonate globules. These are really rare. You don't find these in meteorites. It means something happened. On Earth, to make carbonate, which we see everywhere, I mean, Perth is pretty much carbonate. The, the Nullarbor Plain is pretty much carbonate. To make carbonate on Earth, you need liquid water. So people are like, how did this carbonate get in here? And they started looking at those little rims so that the edges of those globules, so there's the orange bit, and then there's like a black, white, black, stripy bit around it. That black, white, black is, um, it's composed of magnetite, and then some other carbonate, and then another rim of magnetite. They started looking at that, that's really weird. So they were looking at all of that, they analyzed those things, they analyzed the rock, the bulk rock, and they found that it had something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in it, which is, organic material, um, and then they used a machine that was just out right then called a field emission gun scanning electron microscope, which is basically fire a beam of electrons at a rock, and what happens when it comes off, you can really visualize things really interestingly, and you can also get chemistry out of this. But what they did was, with their visualization, they could get to this really high resolution, tiny, tiny, tiny things. And they found this thing on the rock when they analyzed it in this particular instrument. Now, if you look at that little thing, I don't know how well it shows up there, but yeah, no, you can see it. So if you look at that little thing, it's kind of got a wormy looking shape and it's got kind of these little, uh, these little segments. When you think back to that oldest fossil from Earth, it looks really similar. You kind of look at it and you go, oh, that looks like a fossil. And then if you take that into account with the fact that you have carbonate, which is organic materials, you have these uh, other organic materials that exist. There are also organic bug, organic, yeah, bug type things that excrete magnetite. So all of these things together, it was like, oh, we found evidence for life. We found evidence for life on Mars. Even President Clinton came on the TV and gave a news press about this. And that has now been put into every kind of movie about life on other things. It turns out you can get a lot of this stuff in a way that doesn't include life. You can get all these things in ways that aren't biological. And the main thing that was pointing to the biology was the fossil, the nano fossil. That thing is extremely small. It has never been shown to be a fossil. It is, the, the potential is that it was a piece of um, material that came off the instrument. So it was really hard to prove that it was a fossil. But what this paper did was say, we need to know how to identify life on another planet. We need to study this. We need to do this in a methodical way. And so astrobiology came about. And this is why we keep going to Mars. This is why three spacecraft have gone to Mars this year. And this is why there have been roughly 50 missions sent to Mars, is we are trying to figure out 
Is this true? Is this possible? The stuff that we have on Earth, the rocks that we have here on Earth that come from Mars, don't fit necessarily with the idea that there was life there, except for this one. And then, what do we do? So that's why we keep going back, we keep looking. We start to look at the surface of Mars. This is a, this is a map of Mars that was made by a laser that is showing you how high things are. How far am I over? No, not quite yet. I'm okay? Getting close? 802. How many? Oh, 802? Mm. Oh, I gotta speed up. Okay, I'll speed up a little bit. Elevation. White is really, really high. Blue is really, really low. So what, there's this big canyon here, and then you can kind of see these drainage things, and you kind of think, oh man, there must have been an ocean up there. The northern hemisphere is really, really low. Must have been an ocean, lots of water. We can see all these weird morphologies. Apologies, this is mostly US-based missions because they're the one that sends the rovers, and so that's what's there. They just sent this one called Perseverance. The Chinese have also sent a rover. It, I don't know where it's gonna go. I think it's gonna go into some place that's really close to between Viking 2 and Insight, somewhere in there. Um, but basically, we're looking for this evidence. Uh, Perseverance has landed in a place called Yezero Crater. That's this crater, um, which you can, you can kind of see, here's the edge of the crater. Uh, but what they're really interested in is this thing here. So when you look at this thing here, um, if you were to ever look at uh, a map of the, the Nile dumping into, uh, the Nile River dumping into the Mediterranean Sea or the Mississippi River dumping into um, the uh, Car Caribbean Sea, you would see kind of a thing that looks like this. It's, it's a delta. Those would be underwater, this is not underwater. So this is why they chose this place. They wanted to go, this is just a false color map to show you where different compositions kind of lie. This is spectroscopy. So this is looking at how light interacts with the surface and if you combine it all, you can say something about composition. So we know the different colors mean slightly different compositions, but we don't know exactly what they all are yet. People have mapped this in detail, which is why we picked this place, and there's a whole bunch of different types of things. We talk about this delta. We're not sure if this is a delta that forms by a river falling into a bigger place, a lake area, or if it's something called an alluvial fan, where it's just, it, there's just material that's coming down off a mountain kind of thing. Uh, that's the Perseverance rover. It landed. <laughs> we like it when they land. Uh, it's better than when they fly by, <laughs> accidentally. Uh, it has a whole suite of instrumentation on it. It landed here, they calculated, so you can see it's really close to the delta. It's actually gonna drive, I'm sorry, I'm not doing well with my pointing. Um, it's gonna drive from where it landed and it's gonna try and go up and out and follow this, um, this river pathway and, and try to figure out what it's, what we can learn from that. It's going to take measurements along the way. It has chemical analysis uh, instruments on board. It has a little helicopter as a technical, um, uh, they want a demonstration of whether they can make a helicopter work. So it's got this tiny little helicopter. It's got a seismometer, so it will drill down and it will try to understand more about the interior of, of Mars. Because we don't have seismics on other planets. It's very, very rare, so we don't know what the interiors are. We have to guess from how spacecraft interact with them. Um, it's landed there, so it's gonna drive up there. It'll take a long time. It has all this instrumentation, like I said, lots and lots and lots of stuff going on there. Um, the, all of that instrumentation came down from more than, uh, more than 60 proposals for different instruments. They brought it down to 12 because, or, or what, however many that is, um, because it's a weight issue, right? They have to launch it and they have to get it off Earth. And as soon as we can get to the moon and launch from the moon, it's gonna be so much easier to do things. We can send a bunch of stuff. But until we can do that, which is, you know, very soon, Artemis is happening, yay. We're going back to the moon. Um, we can do this, we can learn a lot. The idea here also is that Perseverance is gonna go and find, um, 
the samples that we want to look at in more detail is going to put them in a special place and then they're going to come back to Earth on a later mission. So based on what we know, sorry, I sped through Mars. Mars is like most of the fun, but I, I, I sped through it. But the bottom line is this is a potential of what Mars' ancient um, surface looked like. It could have had a whole ocean. There could be life there. We have this evidence for water, but what we really need to do is find a way to, um, to, to track it and get that evidence. So then, I got three more. Exoplanets. How do we apply this to something else? Until the 90s, we didn't know there were other planets around other stars. Now there are thousands of planets around other stars. You can go to the NASA website, which is this. If you go to that website, it tells you, you can actually get this 3D interactive map that will let you point to any place in the part of the sky that they've looked at, and it will zoom into that star and it will show you the orbits of the planets that they've been able to determine that are flying around in orbit around those stars. And they'll give you the information of what they can learn about it. They can tell whether it's a rocky planet. They can tell how big it is. They can tell how close to the star it's orbiting. There are some that are basically um, touching the star as they orbit by. Um, exoplanets, this is basically an image that shows you for one system called TRAPPIST-1. Uh, the letters are the exoplanets that they've found and we're putting it in relation to how, how the solar system works. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and it has B, C, D in about the same places relative to its star. Um, okay, and the final thoughts really are that it's possible that we will find evidence for life on other planets in our lifetime, my lifetime. That means you guys are gonna have lots of fun things to look at. It's possible that we might be able to find evidence for life on exoplanets. We might be able to find a whole bunch of stuff that will help us understand. Because right now, everything we do is about how do we, how do we take what we see in a, in a telescope and we have to turn it into something that we understand here. So can we take that and say, okay, that spectroscopy says this, this chemistry, but you're looking at a point of light and you're trying to extract all of this information. It's, it's amazing. Um, and so I just want to say, these are really exciting times. I think that you, you are the wave of the future. If this is something you're interested in, you guys are going to ask the really interesting questions and you're going to drive all of this. So thank you very much. That is all. During the, a small Q&A time, if you have a question, we can throw you this. And you have to catch it, and you can ask any question you like of Professor Gretchen. So, does anybody have a question? You ready to catch? Oh, no! <laughs> First time that's ever happened. We have to stick it in. Um, when you were talking about the Artemis um, mission, what's the Artemis mission? Good question. So, um, a bunch of countries, including Australia, have uh, signed up to go back to the moon. So, NASA in the United States is the one that is kind of driving it. Um, they want to set up a base on the moon. And so, they are working right now to send uh, people back to the moon to set up a base. We want to find a way to, they're going to they're gonna build um, another type of space station called Lunar Gateway, which is something that will orbit between the moon and Earth that will allow us to get material from the Earth to the moon more easily. Right now, to launch things from Earth, like to actually get something off Earth and so that it goes out into the solar system, it, it costs a lot, but it costs a lot because of gravity. So gravity really holds on to mass. So Earth is big, holds on to mass. So to get anything off Earth, you have to push really, really hard. So you need a really big rocket, and you need a really big rocket with a lot of fuel. And it's really hard 
to do that a lot of times. And we're now to a point where we really want to try and see what's out there. What can, we, what can we get out there in the solar system? There's a lot of talk about mining, and you might hear that. It's not, necessary, not necessarily that we want to go and mine Mars for iron or gold. That stuff will be there, but it's not, that's not feasible. But what we can do is we can mine for fuel because rocket fuel turns out to be broken up water. If you can take water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, and you can rip it apart so you have your hydrogen by itself and your oxygen by itself, you have rocket fuel. And on the moon, we know there are craters that have ice in them. They're permanently shadowed. They never see the sun. There's ice there. So there's possibility that we could set this up in the near future. And so that's what, we're, that's what Artemis is all about, is getting people back to the moon and, and really setting up a way to explore the solar system um, so that we can, we can stretch beyond our, our boundaries. Good question. Any others? Any other questions? They don't have to be about space. I'm nervous but to I throw it this time, seeing as that last time <laughs> fell apart. Oh, nice catch. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the lecture. Very interesting. So you talked about uh, the Goldilocks zone, the habitable zone, uh, which is uh, the zone most suitable for creating life and creating those amino acids. Um, but there's also um, uh, like, you know, asteroids that, you know, revolve around, you know, the sun or, you know, various stars. They're not permanently in a habitable zone, but they periodically do enter and then exit that habitable zone. Yeah. And then due to their orbit um, and their cyclical nature, there's a, a greater chance for them to, uh, you know, for chemical processes to then start. Yeah. Um, so those amino acids may start to develop on you know some of those asteroids and they and they then may land on other planets not necessarily inside that habitable zone yeah. and then seed life yep. outside of those yep. Goldilocks zones yeah so that is yeah so uh, ha is there a, a way that we can search you know for life under those circumstances or there it's just naturally less likely that that may occur that's a huge question. Uh, one of the biggest questions about how did life originate on Earth is, were the ingredients here and it spontaneously occurred here, or were the ingredients delivered by comets or asteroids? Or were the ingredients picked up by uh, rocks impacting Mars, Mars material coming to Earth and seeding the Earth? Huge question. Right now, I don't think we have an answer to being able to say whether it's one or the other until we find proof of those conditions and ingredients on another planet. We know that, we know that the amino acids are definitely found in these asteroids. And those asteroids definitely do end up coming close to the Earth because we have them in our hands and we can analyze them. Um, but the amount of material in the asteroid belt isn't actually a huge amount. And the amount of, the number of asteroids that we know to contain this is even less. So the amount of material, uh, the, the material is there, but if you need this and this and this and this and this, if, if it's a series of very fortunate events that occur, that's going to be a really interesting um, question to unravel. But yeah, you've hit, hit the nail there on the head. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience here? Yeah. Oh. I was going to do a big loop. But, uh, yeah, so you spoke about, like, just then a series of fortunate events. How do you know that on a planet, say, it has all the ingredients for life? How do you know that those series of fortunate events are going to even occur? Another excellent question. You don't. Um, you know, you start to, you start to think about... Um, all the things that needed to occur. And it may be that the, the, the series of fortunate events is basically statistics. As long as you have enough of everything and you have an overabundance of everything, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna make it go. Um, 
I think as long as you have all the ingredients and you have the environmental conditions and you have all of that, I think that the odds are better that you can get the thing to, you can get life to start. But it, it could be that, you know, we had to have plate tectonics start at the right time on Earth. We had to have oxygen take over as, you know, a, a more abundant part of the atmosphere in order for life to take off. Um, it, there's a whole bunch of different things that occur. And it may be that you don't have to do them in a certain order. Maybe you just have to do them at some point and eventually you end up in the same spot. Good question. Um, um, do you know how a spacecraft would detect if other moons have the core? So it's a thing called inertia, so it's physics. So when two bodies rotate around each other, um, when a spacecraft goes flying by another body, the, the way that that body has its weight distributed makes its gravity do things, so it will make the spacecraft wobble in a certain way. I don't know fully how it works. I just know that this is the thing. It has to do with how these, so they, they can work out how, what the bodies are like by looking at how they orbit each other. So if you look at Jupiter and you look at the moons going around Jupiter, you can tell something about their interiors by looking at how their orbits might wobble a little bit. So it gets into, it gets into a bunch of orbital mechanics, um, probably into some really interesting relativity stuff as well um, on how these things will, so, so if a mass is distributed evenly, instead of in pieces, it'll affect how that orbit goes in different ways. Any other questions? Um, remember, um, before you were talking about uh, a, an asteroid, sorry, a meteorite, that looked like coal, I remember back there. It started with an M. Murchison. Um, yeah, have you seen it? I have, I've worked on it. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really, um, we've, even, we've even CT scanned it. So you can, you can scan, you can you, uh, do uh, computed tomography scans of rocks now, so you just hit them with a really high beam. High, high energy beam, but it's, you know, it's like an x-ray for humans, it's, but, but with rocks, it's really interesting, because normally we just have to cut a piece off, and then you just look at that piece, and that's all you see. And, um, but sometimes you want to be able to see what's going on throughout it, because sometimes these rocks have been really mixed up and jumbled up. So I've been able to do that, but I also, I spent a lot of time just looking at that rock and thinking about it. So it's really, I got to go to Murchison a couple of years ago, it was really fun. <laughs> I, I have one question. I, I noticed on one of your slides you had a you talked about those carbonate globules, and, and, and yeah. if I'm correct, you sort of spoke about the importance of water and the significance of water in the formation of carbonates. I'm a chemistry teacher, and I feel like one of my one of the very common systems we talk about in equilibrium is carbonate, calcium carbonate forming from just carbon dioxide and calcium oxide. So when you said you need water to make carbonates, I was like. I can think of a system where that's not the case. Um, that's super useful. So when I was doing all of my stuff, um, it was you, you had to make a it, was it HCO3. So you you yeah so bicarb, and that mixes with when you have a rock, you have your calcium is in the ca calcium oxide form, yeah. um, and so your CO2 doesn't interact with the rock or something, so you have to have a catalyst of the water to turn the water, to, for the carbon to get into the water so that it interacts with the calcium. Yeah, okay. To make the calcium carbonate. Yeah. Yeah. So one of our systems we often talk about in equilibrium is just that closed system with just the gas and the solid. I imagine, Dino, you're right, right across that okay. one. Right, yeah. um, But then if water's so present. Yeah, so then what are the conditions that, you know, mm. where you've got the gas and the solid like that? Yeah. And would that be equivalent? I mean, because that could be a really interesting thing. Yeah, to yeah. Look what at. are the conditions that yield enough of it as well would be one of the yeah. one of the yeah, questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we 
we've got some budding next generation scientists here. You've done a really cool thing reading your biography. You had a meteorite named after you. Asteroid. Asteroid, sorry. Yeah, sorry. How do you get an asteroid named after you? Uh, you have to have a friend who knows the discoverer of the asteroid. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of asteroids, um, originally the asteroids started being named after Greek, mostly Greek minor deities. So the first asteroid ever found was named Ceres, who's the Greek goddess of the hearth. And then you, you go along and, you know, there's Eros and there's Pallas and there's Vesta. So there's all these like Roman and Greek god names. And then there's, mil there's a million asteroids now. We ran out of Greek god names. And so after a while they started, well, okay, the Beatles can all have asteroids. So there's four asteroids that are named after the Beatles. Um, and then, it, but it, it comes down to, in our, in our society, uh, the Meteoritical Society, um, we interact with astronomers who search for and discover asteroids. And they have the option of providing a name. Asteroids get, have, a, have a numerical designation so they get a designation that's based on the year they were found, the two-week period of the year they were found, the, oh, there's, another, there's another letter, and then a number. And so my asteroid is actually called 1986 ES1, <laughs> but it's also called 6,000, oh, something Benedicts. <laughs> I can't remember the rest of the number. But yeah, that, that's, that's how you, 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 you get to know someone who knows the astronomer who discovered them. Yeah. It's, yes. it's a bit about collaboration, yes. yes. <laughs> I saw one question at the back. So um, currently all the forms of life are carbon-based, could you say that? Is there a possibility that the extraterrestrial life could be not carbon-based? It could, and I used to think about that a lot, and then I started teaching mineralogy. And it turns out that the reason rocks are mostly made out of silicate materials, the most common types of rocks that are made out of silicate materials, is because of how silica and oxygen, silicon and oxygen bond. But carbon and oxygen also do that, and carbon and hydrogen also do that really, really well. So it's a very, um, it's the easiest, least energy, uh, it uses the least energy to, to do that. I think silicon is the next obvious option, but I think um, it, it would be a really weird environment for that to happen. But it's a great question. I think it's not out of the question, but I think it's just based on abundance of elements and ease of making the, the, the molecules and the connections. I feel like this question is so, sort of simple, but um, it intrigued me. Uh, you have those, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're flying past the moons and they're, they're taking photos. How do they get those photos to scale? Like, to scale? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Okay, so, so what happens is that the, the, spacecraft, the spacecraft is flying by, it has a camera on it. Um, there are some really ingenious people who, the spacecraft will basically take a whole bunch of images and it, it will just be flying by and taking all these images. Um, there's a way that you can reorient images so that all of them can be lined up and connected. And so they have got amazing ways to create these mosaics. Um, sometimes the spacecraft will be far enough away that it will get everything in one picture. And so in the case of, probably in the case of that Jupiter, Europa, and Io one, um, I think that was all a single image. So that's the, I think that was Juno from some far away. But they'll have filters as well because Jupiter would be so bright that it would just wash out anything. So they'll have filters that allow you to kind of tone down Jupiter and still be able to see Europa and Io. Um, but those are great. Now, those are not simple questions. They're, they're actually, they, they, if, you go, if you go on NASA, you can go to the Galileo site. So Galileo was the first really big spacecraft interrogation of Jupiter. 
they show um, one of their first mosaics, and it's just you can it's just pictures kind of with a blank space in between them. And now, you know, 15, 20 years later, we can take them and just stitch them all together and make it look like a single image. There's a lot of engineering that goes into all of this stuff, which is really, you know, when you, when you think about space science, you think, oh, it's, it's just studying that, that rock or that planet or whatever. It's not. To get a spacecraft out there, you have to you have to do the science, you have to have the science question, but in order to get that spacecraft out there, you need engineers, you, you need maths, you need physics, you, you need everything to be able to create that spacecraft and be able to go do the thing that you envision it doing and answering the question you want it to answer. Well, Dino, I might hand over to you to Wrap, wrap up the evening. I, at the at the end of that, I might uh, finish with a couple of logistics, um, but I'll let you sort of wrap up and say thanks very much to our okay, guest yeah, speaker. Okay, that was and a fascinating talk. Thank you so much for kicking off our series for 2021. Um, and it just, uh, please join me in thanking Gretchen for a fantastic talk. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for uh, coming along and I and, uh, hope you enjoyed the evening and thanks for your great questions. Um, I know that uh, that whole lecture has been recorded uh, quite successfully. There was a little moment where the audio cut out on Facebook, but apparently that was Facebook's problem. Um, but other, other than a little moment there, I think we've had a, a really uh, great recording of, uh, of our presentation as well and uh, we had some chat going back and forth there on Facebook. Um, a couple of logistics I really should have said at the start, but there is some toilets just out through this door. <laughs> if before you go home you wish to go to the bathroom, you're welcome to head out this way uh, on, uh, before you go home. Uh, the other thing is before you go home, you may also want to re-enter this room. I'm pretty sure I haven't gone in. I hope this is not a false promise, but the cookies and sausage rolls uh, may still be there. So please, um, before you leave, make yourself... Uh, Go that way. Go via that door. No one will judge you. Just go via that door and have a little look. Thanks very much for coming. I hope you really enjoyed it. And once again, thanks to Professor Gretchen. Have a great night.